Good morning. It's great to see all of you today, and we also want to welcome those of you who are joining us online to worship. Today is the first Sunday of Lent, which leads us from now all the way up to Easter to focus on Jesus and his life of sacrificial service and love. And so our hope is that God speaks into your life during this time, during this very special season, his love and his goodness as we reflect on our own, our own need for forgiveness in our lives. I don't have many announcements to share with you today, but I would like uh, to ask Don and Neff to come. She has a quick announcement for you. Good morning, everyone. Hope everyone is staying warm and being careful walking around on that snow. I wanted to give you a quick update on the TCK or College Kids Ministry. Uh, we have had an overwhelming response to that and all the kids are sponsored for the care packages that will be sent out and I just want to say I am just very excited and touched by the sponsorship and how quickly the spots got filled. And I also wanted to let you know that if you want to connect with these kids, you can still connect with them. I have a list over there of all their addresses. Uh, there are three that are um, doing their schooling at home and then the rest of them are at college. They are at the college campuses. So if you want to connect with them, you want to reach out to them in any way, please pick up a list and stay connected with these kids and let them know that they are supported. Thank you. Thanks, Don. And now before we continue, just turn quickly and say hello to somebody that's sitting around you. Uh, be sure to welcome them here today. And as we continue, I want to read from Romans chapter 3. This is verses 21 to 24, and it says, But now a righteousness from God, apart from the law, has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came through Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. God, we thank you so much for your gift of grace to us. Righteousness that we don't deserve, but that you have given through your Son. Thank you for taking our sins and laying them on Jesus, our Savior and our hope. Father, speak into our lives today and remind us again that you are a God of love and forgiveness a God who reveals your goodness and mercy to us with each new morning. So do that again today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The season of Lent is the 40-day period preceding Easter, not counting Sundays. The number 40 was chosen to represent the 40 days of Jesus' temptation in the wilderness, as well as the 40 years Israel wandered in the desert. The color for the season is purple. Purple is the symbol of passion and repentance, as well as royalty. It reminds us, therefore, to prepare our hearts and lives for the coming of the King of Glory, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Of him we read in John 1, 14, the, world, the Word became flesh and lived for a while among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus came as the light of the world, but the world resisted his illumination. This series of readings reverses the Advent observance where we light one additional candle each Sunday. Instead, we will be extinguishing one more candle each week, reminding us of Jesus' verdict on the world in John 3:19:20. Light has come into the world, but the people love darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. 
Therefore, who does, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. As we extinguish the first Lenten candle, let us ponder whether our lives bring darkness or light into the world. Please remain standing as we sing All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name.
You may be seated as we go to prayer. Let's look to the Lord together. Father, we have come this morning to give you our praise and to give ourselves in worship to you. We come broken, restless, unfinished, fragmented, but we also know that in you we are restored, reconciled, and reunited because of one reason, Jesus' blood and his righteousness. And so, Father, thank you for healing our lives through your Son. Thank you for making a way when there was no other way we rest in the promise of your forgiveness, that you accept us, not because of who we are, but because of your kindness, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us, and you honor us as your children. God, remind us once again of who we are in you, chosen, that we are forgiven, that we are loved, blessed, and adopted into your family, that we are honored and treasured by you, the creator of the universe, because you want us to know you. Father, we confess our sins to you. We are far from who we desire to be, and we are humbled by your mercy. So just take a moment now, wherever you're seated, to confess to God your sins and your struggles in prayer. Tell him what you're sorry for and just ask him to forgive and to help you. God, thank you for hearing our prayers and for receiving us. Father, we thank you this morning for your word and the promises that you've given Help us to listen closely to your truth and not to the wisdom of this world. Help us to take every thought captive and to weigh it against your truth for our lives. We pray that you would dispel the lies and that you would help us turn against temptation and the confusion that Satan would like us to experience, to doubt your character and to diminish our faith. We pray that you would defeat the enemy in our lives and that you would help us to live victorious in Christ. So God, strengthen our faith today as we seek you together. And as we start this new series, that you would help us to realize that in surrendering everything to you, we can live in your power. Lord, teach us from your word today. We ask that you would bless Pastor Nathan as he shares it with us. And Lord, help us to bring everything to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Now before he comes, let's sing together, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.
What a great reminder for us to turn our eyes upon Jesus. What comes to mind when you hear the words Mardi Gras? <laughs> Yell it out, party. What else? New Orleans. New Orleans. Parties, crowds, parades, drinking, Bourbon Street, maybe costumes, wearing a mask. You don't have to go to New Orleans to wear a mask, though, these days. Craziness. How about beads? Lots and lots of beads. Did you know there's an estimated 25 million pounds of beads tossed during Mardi Gras each year? Here's them cleaning up the beads and everything. In, in 2018, they pulled 46 tons of beads from the storm drains. 46 tons of beads. What is Mardi Gras all about? Well, Mardi Gras is simply French for Fat Tuesday. That's what it's all about. It's meant to be a Christian celebration where you eat all the rich, fatty foods before Lent. If you grow up like me in Pennsylvania Dutch country, you don't have Fat Tuesday. We call it Fasnacht Day. And of course, Fasnacht is translated tasteless lump of dough, <laughs> right? That's what it means, literally. Actually, if you look at the, the word there, Fasnacht, you ever notice that there's two words there, if you know a little bit of German, there's fast, fasting, and what's the other word? Night, right. So it's night of fasting. It's Fat Tuesday, the night before uh, the fasting, and it's your last chance to eat all the donuts you can before Lent. Shove your face full of vanilla, long johns, and other um, donuts. So that's what Mardi Gras has uh, become as well, it's your last chance to get in all the sinning you can before Ash Wednesday, the beginning of Lent. They have a similar party celebration in Brazil, in Rio, called Carnival. It's interesting that the word carnival or carnival comes from the Latin two words, flesh, carni, and veil, to put away the flesh. When you think of a carnival, you don't think of putting away the flesh, do you? Saying goodbye to the flesh. And perhaps it has to do with uh, giving up meat. Carney is either meat or flesh, giving up meat for Lent. But I think it originated in denying your flesh. Carnival is all about denying your sinful nature for Lent, kissing the flesh goodbye during carnival and Mardi Gras. Is interesting because usually those are the times when people indulge in the flesh, right? As much as they can, they want to get their last sinning in before Lent. I know a guy from uh, Brazil that met a woman last carnival, and uh, during carnival got her pregnant, and now he's married and has a kid. So it's the, the last chance to sort of... Uh, you know, do all the sinning you can, and so it can get you in trouble. Here's a shirt that summarizes how many people view Mardi Gras and Carnival. Can you read what it says? Sin, repent, repeat. Isn't that awful? Sin, repent, repeat. People say, I'm going to go out and sin all I can, and then I'm going to go and ask God for forgiveness, and I'm just going to go out and do it again, and I'm proud of it, so proud I'm going to wear a shirt. Here's a picture of a guy from Mardi Gras. Isn't this disgusting? If you don't sin, Jesus died for nothing. He's sort of proud, saying, I'm going to go sin all I want, because Jesus is going to forgive me. And if I don't sin, Jesus died for nothing. Many people do this year after year. They mock God, going, having celebration, partying. And right after Mardi Gras or Carnival, they'll go right to Catholic Mass. Right, right from the party and drinking and sinning. 
right to the celebration where they get ashes put on their head during Ash Sunday or Ash Wednesday, saying, Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, forgive me, God, for all my sins. Now, before we get too judgmental, don't we all fall into that pattern too? Don't you fall into that pattern? I know I do. Sin, repent, repeat. We do it all the time, don't we? Sin, repent, God, forgive me. And you repeat it over and over. I do that, you do that. But the difference between a follower of Christ and someone who's just playing games is that we don't feel proud about it. We don't wear a shirt that says, this is what I love doing. We're broken over our sin. A follower of Christ is broken over their sin. They truly want to say goodbye to their flesh, to truly have carnival, to get rid of or say goodbye to the worldly, fleshly nature. So this past Sunday, or I keep saying Sunday, this past Wednesday was Ash Wednesday, which marks the beginning of Lent. And as Becky Beck mentioned, Lent is the 46 days before Easter. It's 40 regular days and six Sundays. And the Bible never mentions Lent, but Jesus did fast and and pray in the wilderness for 40 days. And some people point to this passage uh, in Matthew chapter 4 as the reason for us to deny ourselves. In the early church, baptisms were often held on Easter, and Lent was the time for those getting baptized to prepare their hearts to get ready for giving their lives fully to Christ. Now, we at Trinity tend not to focus a whole lot on Lent. It's more of a a thing for our Catholic brothers and sisters, but Um, it's a good thing for us to also consider what we need to give up to follow Christ. What do you need to give up to follow Christ? It's a, a good thing for us to put away the flesh, to deny ourselves of certain things. During Lent, we're gonna have a series called I Give Up. I Give Up. What are you giving up for Lent? And perhaps you haven't thought of that before, but maybe today's the time to to start thinking about what you would like to give up for Lent. Is there something that you need to give up for Lent? Usually I joke that I I give up broccoli or Brussels sprouts, one one or the other. But And many people are like that. They can give up something that's relatively easy. Aren't certain things relatively easy to give up? Chocolate. For you, maybe that's not easy, but... Chocolate, coffee, social media, those things are relatively easy to give up. It's funny how some people give up chocolate for 40 days and then they eat 15 pounds of it on Easter. You notice that? The goal of giving up something for Lent isn't just denying yourself of something. It's to minimize all the noise, all the distractions, so that you can maximize hearing God's voice. If you're trying to hear someone's voice, you want to minimize all the distractions, don't you? To say everything else needs to be quiet so I can really be in tune, in our case, to what Jesus is saying to us. And sometimes we need to give up certain things that distract us from hearing from God. And the end goal is intimacy with God, to know him better, to get closer to him. So what is getting in the way of your relationship with God? Are there certain things that distract you lately from your relationship with God, certain external things that keep you from communicating more with God? TV, social media, perhaps certain kinds of um, entertainment. What do you need to give up to pursue Him more fully? But during our series of Lent, we don't want to just focus on those external things like chocolate, coffee, etc. We want to focus on those internal things that keep us from God. Those things like pride, greed, idolatry, fear. The word Lent's interesting. It comes from the Old English meaning springtime or spring. And so some people during spring, they like to do spring cleaning And Lent for us is a reminder that we need to do some spring cleaning in ourselves, inside of us. During our series, we want to encourage you not to just give up sometimes those shallow external things that we sometimes give up for Lent, but what are those deep-rooted sins that we need to give up 
those things that perhaps have been with us for a long time, and it's time for us to do some spring cleaning in our souls and deal with some things that we haven't dealt with for a long time. So what are you giving up for Lent? What deep sins do you need to give up? Okay, so as I was thinking about how to kick off this series, I thought, what's the number one thing that we all need to give up for Lent? And I thought it's, it's really appropriate for us to start with ourselves, to give up ourselves for Lent. God wants you to give up yourself for Lent. He wants you, all of you, your heart, your mind, your whole self. And so this idea of giving up yourself is a, the language of discipleship that we see throughout all the New Testament. God wants us to get rid of this uh, pattern of sin, repent, repeat. Sin, repent, repeat. And to be really changed from the inside out. So we need to do that. How we do that is we give up ourselves to God. So what does that look like? And instead of looking at one passage this morning, I'm going to look at several different passages of what it looks like to give up yourself for Lent. What does it mean to give up yourself? How do we see this in the New Testament? Let's look at six different ways to give up yourself. And if you have the half sheet uh, bulletin, you can look there and um, you'll find um, some notes there. You can follow along. What giving up yourself looks like? What does it uh, look like? First, it looks like surrender. Surrender. When I was a kid, we used to play this game. Sometimes you'd call it mercy, or sometimes it's uncle. You know, those kind of games that you uh, wrestle, at least guys did this, you know. Uh, they'd, they'd put their hands like this, and they'd go back and forth, or, you know, one guy would grab the, uh, you know, the other guy, and he's behind it. And, and what's he say? Say uncle, or say mercy, right? And you're like, oh, I'm trying to, trying to keep from saying it, and then all of a sudden, you, you just can't, you can't hold off anymore. And you say, uncle, 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 you know, mercy, you know? And what is it, what is that? It's saying, I surrender, I give up. It's a way of saying to, to God. Now, God doesn't force himself on us like that. He doesn't twist our arm to follow him. He wants us to surrender to him freely by our choice. He's not saying, I'm gonna force you to do it. We submit ourselves to God. James 4 says, submit yourselves then to God. Put yourself under his authority. Submit to God by saying, God, you win. I, I raise the white flag, I surrender all to you. We sing a song called, I surrender some, right? No, it's I surrender all. God, I surrender. I, I wave the, the white flag. I, I surrender all to you. Mercy. Please have mercy on me. I cry, uncle. I give up. I surrender. It's all saying the same thing. Paul tells the, the Corinthians, always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. So we want to give up more than uh, chocolate, or coffee, or maybe alms to the poor for Lent. We want to give up ourselves by surrendering ourselves to God, saying, mercy, I surrender to you, and I know you're not going to force me to do it. I want to do it on my own. I submit myself to you. A second term for giving up yourself is sanctification. Sanctification simply means to be made holy, sacred, set apart. You see a, a, a cow in India, you say, holy cow, right? It's a, a cow that is set apart for special service. It's different. It's unique. It's set apart. And as followers of Jesus, we are called to be set apart, holy people, set apart from the world, different than the world. Again, Paul says in Corinthians, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of God. You were set apart people, holy people. In the Old Testament, God wants his people to be different. He says, be holy because I'm holy. Be different than the world. Are you different than the world? Would we see you at Mardi Gras or Carnival hanging out with everyone else and then going to church the next day? 
Do you talk differently than your non-Christian friends? Do you act differently than your non-Christian neighbors? Are you sanctified? Are you holy? Are you set apart? Or do you look like everyone else in the world? Do you think people will say to you, you know, I wasn't sure about this whole Christianity thing, but then, you know, I noticed that you gave up chocolate for Lent. And I'm convinced that Jesus is Lord. Do you think that's going to happen? Or do you think people are going to notice how we love differently than the world? How we sacrifice differently than the world? How we live differently? How we talk differently than everyone else? They'll notice, like, I notice you don't swear like everyone else at the office. I notice that you do so, so many nice things. They're not going to say, oh, I noticed you gave up coffee. Man, you must, I, I, I think, I think, yeah, this whole Christianity thing must be true, right? So another way of giving up yourself to God is sanctification. And the third way is making Jesus Lord. It's another term for giving yourself to God. Is Jesus the Lord of your life? Is he the master, the one who's calling the shots, the one who has supreme authority in your life? Romans 10 tells us, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your hearts that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. 2 Corinthians 4 says, for what we preach is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord. We preach him as the master We don't like this idea of someone being master over us, do we? It's not a pleasant thing. But Paul uses this exact language. I am a slave of Jesus Christ, or I am a servant of Jesus Christ. And a slave or a servant says, whatever you want, master, you're in charge. We submit to him, not because he's bad and he's forcing us to submit. We submit because he's good and we love him. Is Jesus your master? Another way of giving up yourself in Scripture that, that we see is taking up your cross. Taking up your cross doesn't mean just going through a tough time. Some people say, you know, I, oh, that's my cross to bear, you know, eating my, my spouse's food. That's my cross to bear, you know. Whatever it is, that's not the case in my, in my household, by the way. Just so you know, don't, I don't want anyone saying anything this morrow. The, and the Romans would force people to carry their cross. It was a very public thing on the, on the way to being crucified. And imagine, you know, the same kind of thing. You're on death row. You're walking by all the other inmates, and they're uh, jeering and, and uh, yelling at you as you're going to the electric chair. It's a very public thing disgraceful things, and everyone knows that carrying your cross meant you're going to die. And so this is a way of giving up yourself. Jesus said to to his disciples, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. What good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? Luke adds the word daily. Take up your cross daily. Following Jesus isn't something we just do during Lent. We deny ourselves every day. It's a daily thing to give yourself to God. Take up your cross and follow him daily. Now closely related to this is dying to yourself. Dying to yourself. It's a way to give up yourself To give up yourself means you're going to die to your own will, your own desires. Romans 6 says, in the context of baptism, you know, in baptism, we die to ourselves, we go under the water in death, and we come back uh, out of the water in new life in Christ. And so in that context, in Romans chapter 6, Paul says, for we know that our old self was crucified with him, this idea of dying to yourself so that the body ruled by sin, might be done away with. Not sin, repent, repeat, but the sinful nature is done away with. That we should no longer be slaves to sin. 
We're now slaves to Jesus Christ. Our old self is dead, and we are a new creation in Jesus Christ. Paul says it elsewhere in Galatians 2 like this, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in this body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. There was a a businessman who went to a warehouse. He wanted to buy this warehouse, and it was falling apart. The roof was caving in. The windows all broken. And the real estate agent was trying to sell him this warehouse and said, you know, we can fix the roof. We can fix the windows. And and the businessman said, you know what? Forget about all that. You don't understand what I'm going to do with this. I'm going to level the whole thing, and I'm going to start over. And some people think that when they put their faith in Christ, it's just sort of tweaking some things, fixing things here and there. God's going to repair a few things. God doesn't want to do that. He wants to completely change us, to start over and say, I'm going to wreck the whole thing, destroy the old self, and have a new creation, a new building, a new person. God wants us to be totally different. Giving yourself to God means you're dead to yourself and alive in Jesus Christ. So finally, giving up yourself to God means yielding to the Holy Spirit. Yielding to the Holy Spirit. Paul said, those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. Giving yourself to God means putting away the flesh, carnival. Giving up the flesh because you're being led by the Spirit or yielding to the Spirit. So during Lent, we make room to listen to the Holy Spirit, to yield to the Holy Spirit, to listen to Him speaking to us. And so giving up certain things help us to have that room in our lives to listen to Him more fully. We deny our flesh and live by the Spirit with the goal to please the Holy Spirit, not our sinful nature. So what are you giving up for Lent? What are you going to give up for Lent? The best starting point is to give up yourself. And here are some ideas for us to give up ourselves, perhaps what that might look like in us. Give up your ego and the drive to make a name for yourself. We all want to make a name for ourselves. We all want to be liked, popular. Sometimes we think life is all about us, but give up trying to make yourself great and focus on making Jesus great in your life. Giving up your ego and the drive to make a name for yourself. Next, give up your desires, your will to follow what God wants you to do. Give up what you desire for the sake of what God wants When I was in college, my goal was to be a psychologist. You know, I wanted to, you know, just sit there and listen to someone say, okay, uh uh-huh, uh-huh. How does that make you feel? And then, yep, just make the check out, $100. Yeah, that's what I wanted to do. And God called me, said, no, I don't want you to do that. I want you to be a pastor. And I said, are you sure? And he said, yeah. And I said, are you positive? Yeah, all right. And then, so I went to seminary, and that's, that's all she wrote, you know. But I had to give up what I desired, the things that I was hoping to do, because God called me into ministry. And sometimes we need to pray like Jesus, not my will, but your will be done, just like we see on the rose window I'll take a look at that once again. Not my will, but thine be done. Your will be done. And so many times in life, this is, this is what we have to do. Give up our desires, our will to follow what God wants us to do, not what we want to do. So that's another way to say, I give up myself. Not my will, but yours be done. Next, give up your reputation and identify yourself as a slave of Jesus Christ. Your identification is no longer yourself. I am a Christian, a little Christ, a someone who has my faith and my identity in Jesus Christ, and I am no longer myself. I'm his. 
He is my master. So I love when I, I see athletes, you know, football players or actors, you know, uh, professing faith in Jesus Christ. You see it sometimes on these uh, contests like America's Got Talent, and you know their reputation is on the line, and still they give glory to God or, and, um, you know, say something about Jesus. And it's, it's interesting that they do that because sometimes they know that by doing that, their reputation is on the line. Are you willing to put your reputation on the line for Jesus Christ to be known as a slave of Jesus? Finally, simply put, give up yourself. Give up yourself. Jesus doesn't want you to just give up chocolate this year. He wants you to give up yourself, your will to him. So I want you to bow your heads and think about what you need to give up for Lent. What's keeping you from getting closer to God? What's keeping you from more intimacy with Him? Have you given yourself completely to Him? Or are you like so many on Mardi Gras or Carnival? Sin, repent, repeat with no real change on the inside. Give up yourself to Him for Lent. So what is one thing, just one thing that you need to give up during Lent that's going to help you get closer to God? Lord, we admit that we struggle. We struggle with this pattern in our lives because it's so hard to live in this body. This pattern of sin, repent, repeat. Lord, we pray that we would be changed from the inside out, that there would be lasting change in us. We give up ourselves to you for Lent. We ask that we would die to ourselves, to crucify the old nature, to carnival, to put away the flesh. So, Lord, whatever sin is tempting us, whatever sin is a struggle for us, we pray that you would help us not just during Lent, but daily, to take up our cross and follow you, to deny ourselves, and to live according to the Holy Spirit instead of according to the flesh. And Lord, help us not just to focus on shallow things, chocolate, coffee, other things like that, which can be good to give up, but also, Lord, help us to really focus on those deep-rooted sins to get rid of those things in our lives that we really struggle with, pride, anger, gossip, idolatry, love of the world, love of money, love of so many things but you. So, Lord, teach us what it looks like during Lent to give up ourselves, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand as we sing our closing hymn, Take My Life, Take My Life.
for the benediction, I want to read once again what you just sang. Hopefully you sang with us. Take my life, take my hands, take my feet, take my voice, take my lips, take my silver and gold, take my love, and then finally, take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee, ever only all for thee. Amen.